morning, everyone. Uh, in these uh, next two sessions, we'll be focusing on the issue of hotspots policing, which has been a very important innovation in the evidence-based uh, policing field over the last few decades. Uh, in this first session, I'll just start off with some brief background on hotspots policing and the research evidence in this area, and then we'll move very quickly into what we call our case of places uh, technique for focusing police resources on crime hotspots. And helping me to illustrate the case of places method will be uh, Captain Emmett Williams, who directs the Major Crimes Division of the Richmond, Virginia Police Department, uh, also Officer Thomas Neal, uh, the Richmond uh, Police Department, and also Sergeant Jeff Eggy of the Minneapolis Police Department. He's the Director of Crime Analysis there, so we're uh, very happy to have all of them uh, with us today. And our focus in this session will be on how you implement comprehensive approaches to tackling your crime hotspots, or at least how you lay the foundation for that. So first, in terms of some uh, very brief background, again, hotspots policing refers to police interventions focused on uh, small areas or very specific places where crime is concentrated. Uh, there's no standard definition of the term hotspots, but it's typically used, as we'll use it here, to refer to specific addresses, intersections, street blocks, and clusters of blocks where crime is concentrated. Uh, research in numerous jurisdictions has shown that about half of crime occurs at 5% or less of the street blocks and addresses in a locality. And these patterns tend to be very stable over time, often year in and year out it's the same places accounting for a great deal of your crime. These locations are often nodes for various business and leisure and travel activities. Uh, they have facilities and features that tend to create criminal opportunities and criminogenic conditions. Examples include locations where you find things like bars, convenience stores, apartment complexes, and the like. And it's believed that police can be more effective and more efficient in a number of ways by focusing their efforts on these locations. Uh, for one, you're concentrating your efforts on the places where crime is most likely to occur. Also, officers can arguably generate uh, a more visible presence and have greater perceptual effects in the small space of a hot spot uh, as opposed to over larger areas. And when you focus on these specific places, it might be easier to identify and to change some of the underlying conditions that contribute to crime problems at these locations using techniques like situational crime prevention uh, and working with managers of, of key establishments at these places. Uh, as Cynthia noted, there are now many studies showing that hotspots policing is effective. In our evidence-based policing matrix, we have 24 hotspot studies that were done uh, through 2010. In these studies, police have focused a variety of different types of interventions on hotspots, ranging from uh, directed patrol to more in-depth problem solving. In the vast majority of these studies, over 80 percent, there's evidence that the police were effective in reducing crime at the hotspots. And the weight of evidence from these studies suggests that when you target hotspots, you can reduce crime in these locations and often in surrounding areas without visible signs of displacement. Or if displacement does occur, it's not enough to offset the crime reduction gains. Again, keep in mind that hotspots are places that are particularly conducive to crime, and so the opportunity structure that exists at these specific locations is not necessarily uh, easily replaced elsewhere. Also, as Cynthia mentioned, uh, studies suggest that when police focus their interventions on places, they tend to be more effective than when their interventions are focused on people. Again, here are some tabulations from the uh, evidence-based policing matrix. Uh, and studies, when you look at the place-based studies, the evidence is strongest for interventions where police are focusing on smaller, uh, more targeted uh, locations. So for those of you who are interested in further information about this, uh, further uh, information about the research studies, Again, you can see our evidence-based policing matrix that's online as well as a printout that's in your notebooks. Um, we also have a series of one-page research summaries that you can see. Some of them are uh, in the notebook and many are uh, online. You can also see a longer uh, version of this presentation that I gave at last year's symposium. Both that video and those slides are available uh, online. What we want to focus on today is a bit more on how you go about implementing hotspots policing. And let me just make a few uh, introductory comments to that. Uh, for one thing, you're going to need good geographic crime analysis based on both recent patterns as well as longer term patterns. Uh, and incidentally, this is a slide that's uh, not in your notebooks. It's one I just added in. Uh, again, keep in mind the hotspots are often stable over long periods of time, so it's important to look at those long term patterns. 
Secondly, agencies can try to reorient their everyday patrol around hotspots, uh, encourage officers to focus on the micro places within their beats that tend to generate the most problems. Uh, research suggests that just making 15 minute stops at these places periodically throughout a shift can be beneficial. Uh, and you'll hear more about that today from Sergeant uh, Renee Mitchell from Sacramento PD who recently uh, studied this tactic in uh, Sacramento. And I tend to think that this can be the backbone of your everyday hotspots policing strategies. But the research also suggests that you can get larger crime reduction effects at hotspots by doing uh, more in-depth problem-oriented policing at those locations. And that's going to be a bit more of our focus uh, in these sessions. So how do you go about doing that? Well, for one thing, you need to collect good data on places. Uh, police data systems tend to be set up to track incidents and to track offenders, but arguably we need to do a better job of tracking uh, information and in crime history patterns at problem places. And that's a segue into what we call our case of places method for focusing investigative and other resources on crime hotspots. It's essentially a system we develop to uh, collect better information on problems at hotspots and to help police to develop and track their own interventions and the effects of those interventions at hotspots. In doing this, we sought to borrow from the idea of the detective's case folder and to establish a case folder of sorts on problem places. So we wanted to take something that was familiar to police and show how it could be used and leveraged for hotspots policing. So uh, having said that, who better to talk about uh, detective's folder in case of places than uh, a police detective. So with that, I'll bring up uh, Captain Emmett Williams, who's again the director of the major crimes detectives in the Richmond, Virginia Police Department. He'll start off the uh, discussion of case of places, uh, and incidentally, the uh, case of places forms are in your workbook, so you can follow along uh, as he's talking about that. He'll also be joined by Officer Thomas Neal, who is spearheading a case of places demonstration uh, in Richmond. So let's uh, bring that up. So these are the most recent. Okay. She gave me very specific instructions on the placement of the mic. <laughs> Does that sound? Can you hear me? I don't really don't need this. To be honest with you. Um, good afternoon. I'm Captain Emmett Williams with the Richmond Police Department. Give you a quick overview. Back in December, uh, Professor Lum, Chris came to Richmond Police Department and kind of proposed this case of places uh, demonstration product uh, project to us. Um, they invited me to attend. I went there with an open mind, wanted to hear what they had to say. And she did an exceptional job of selling me on this case of places. She did that by touching on what I love to do best is investigate and then take what we do in major crimes division with homicide case folders and use that kind of as a template to kind of morph in to this case of places. And that kind of struck a nerve there. I kind of liked it. I fed her some information. She returned it back. And we kind of came up with this checklist, this folder on an excellent way for a uh, department or our department doing it now to do some hotspot policing, some area policing. And uh, it was an easy sell because we took something that we were already doing, a homicide checklist, a homicide folder, it's very simple, everybody in this world has one, and kind of morphed that into a case of places. Um, the big thing that we had to accomplish was to get out of the mindset of talking about an individual crime, a single victim, to a place where crime, where crime occurs. Um, or in particular, a place where lots of crime occurs. And in a homicide, you have one victim, you have one case, case of places, you have what I call a game changer, an ability to have a crime stat crush. Um, you can impact a lot of crimes that we have to report. So case of places, uh, it, it kind of broadens your horizons. It makes you not think about just one individual crime, but lots of crimes. Here you can advance the slides if you need to. Oh. There we are. Just this uh, page down by. Okay. Thank you. My one instruction I forgot to get. Um, some of the things you can think about when you have a place are places that generate a large amount of police activity. I mean, we have our standard fare, drug dealing, prostitution, robbery, 
Um, but non-traditional things, graffiti, concert venues, juvenile disorder, um, anything outside the box thinking in your place that you want to attack, it, it, it's something that you can do. Um, you have to be conscious of your resources and the size of the area you want to attack. Um, the smaller the area or the smaller your resources, the smaller the area. The more resources you can put at it, the bigger area you can attack. Mr. Neal or Officer Neal has a fairly substantial area for just one man to be out there attacking alone. He could probably easily do it with a team of a sergeant and five investigators to go out there and help him. So be cognizant of the fact of what size of area you're going to attack, how much resources you can put into it. Um, uh, finding place-based equivalents to traditional case folders. This is really easy. Every case folder has the same thing. Initial report, supplement, victim, suspect, witness, and then warrants, arrest, supplemental information, forensics, things like that. Basically, there's five or six things you can find in a case folder. Well, we adopted this over to a case of places. Um, just as you have a case folder investigate a person for a homicide, you have a case folder investigate a place. Give places their due. It's important. Place are crime generators, so we need to put resources into that. We need to spend as much of our resources investigating a place as we do a homicide. I put a sergeant and five detectives on every homicide. How many people do we actually put on a hot spot? Maybe a drive-by every 15 minutes, half an hour, uh, maybe a drive-by every week. Probably not that much. Maybe if we put a team of investigators on our hot spots, our place, we'd have much better results. Hopefully, the best case scenario, like I talked before, is we could have that game changer. Huge, huge crime reduction numbers. I'm trying to make up some time. Uh, Ms. Lum took away from us here earlier. <laughs> now, what you have here, this is a standard fare. This is our investigative checklist. This is what I gave uh, Professor Lum. And as I, talked in, as I talked earlier, every division, every agency in here has one. Some might be bigger, some might be smaller. Basically, everybody has the same thing. Let's take this list, adapt it to places. Oh, went back. Now, let's break it down. We're talking about crime, history of a place. Um, what do we have here? This is similar to the initial call. This is our first response. Okay, we're not talking about a person, we're talking about our place. Um, how do we get there? Well, we can get there through community. We can get there by police observation. We can get there by officers talking about, telling us what the problems are. And we can get there by maybe even direction of our command staff. The police senior command staff says, this is an area we need to attack. Let's go at it. Uh, A2 talks about uh, backgrounds. This is similar to an investigative background check. If you're doing an investigation, you're checking your suspects, your witnesses, your victim. You want to know everybody's history. Well, this is where crime analysis steps in. Let's get a history on the place that we're investigating here. What has happened in the last few months? What has happened in the last year? It's important to understand the long and short term histories of our place. A3, similar to the history, but this is existing community information that you're gathering. This can come from officers, this can come from community, come from census records, city records, real estate, utilities, any database out there that you can draw some type of history about the place that you've got there. And then A4 talks about prior violations. What's going on in this area? We're looking at an area, you've got multiple venues there. Uh, who has building inspection problems? Who has fire health problems? Know your victims. What's important, just like investigating a crime in the area, know where you were, know where you are, know where you're going, in a place, know what it was, know what it is now, and know what it can be, know where you can take it. All right, I finally figured this technology stuff out here. Let's go to section B, place-based suspects. Suspect in the homicide? Well, we got lots of suspects in our areas here. B1, we talk about suspect information. This can very much be people. People that cause problems, 
repeat offenders to the area, groups of offenders, these could be gangs, formalized gangs, informal gangs, kids just kind of congregating together, juvenile disorder, things like that. But we have suspect in places just like we do in violent crimes. B2, suspect could also be a problem location. This could be a venue, a concert venue. Uh, it could also be an alley where you have graffiti. Uh, it could be a parking lot where you have robberies. Every Friday night when people come to the concert, we have robberies in the parking lot, bus stops, nightclubs, um, places like that can be your victim. D3, talk about environmental conditions. Um, don't worry about environmental conditions too much in a individual uh, investigation, but in place investigations, it's very important. Um, shrubs at block view, your septid issues there. ATM machines hidden in alleyways. Uh, they're there, believe me, they are. Uh, stacked items in storefronts, abandoned cars. Uh, Construction equipment, uh, discarded construction equipment. A lot of times you see lots where just old construction equipment piled up, the homeless move in. Next thing the homeless move in, the robberies go up, the drugs go up, the prostitution comes, and nobody ever thinks just to clean the lot up. So don't just think of suspects as a person. Suspect can be a place. Oh, went backwards. Went backwards again. Where do we go? The left. I got ahead of myself. Oh, there we go. C. Victims. C1. Can be people. They can be serial victims of robbery. Um, they can also be places. Places that are constant victims of crime. Uh, non-person victims, they can be property, can be buildings, can be the community as a whole. It can be a lot of things. So you have to get outside the box of thinking as a victim, as an individual, and let's talk about an area, a place. Um, certain places attack certain crimes. It's important at this stage to get outside the victim mentality of just being an individual and start broadening your mind to think of it as a place. Let's go to D, if I can get this thing going. Keep going wrong. Place-based witnesses. Witnesses in a homicide investigation are people that witness a crime. People can give you direct testimony as to what happened and who did that. It can be informants. People come in and give you informal information. They're not going to testify, but this is an investigative tool that leads you down the path to solve the crime. In place-based witnesses, you have guardians. You have informal guardians, D1. These are your civic leaders, apartment managers, neighborhood watch groups. Um, these are people that are in the community, but don't really provide any direct guardianship, but they're informal guardians. They're there, they can help, they see things. D2, are you more your formal guardians? Who is that? That's the police. Probation and parole can come in there with home visits, private security. Um, I even kind of throw in sometimes a uh, formal guardian could be maybe an organized watch group. I'm talking about an organized watch group, not just somebody that comes out on a random basis. I mean, people that are out there every night between 10 and midnight and 2 and 4, and they do it uh, on a regular schedule. They've got marked vehicles. they got the flashlights, but a real organized watch group. T3, we talk about technology. Um, closed circuit TV has some guardianship there. Fences, signage, traffic patterns have guardianship there. Physical barriers uh, that are up, fences, walls that may be along an interstate. All these things are some type of barriers and they have guardianship there. We should be more open-minded about our guardianship of the places that, are, that we attack. I go back every time, I got short-term memory. Finally, let's get to the intervention. Most times in an investigation, that's your arrest phase. Uh, the arrest is the easy part. Anybody that's investigated a homicide, arresting somebody's easy. It's prosecution where it starts to get hairy. Um, so the intervention here, I like to think of as the arrest in the prosecution phase here. In the in intervention, 
you may have a wide range of place-based intervention with the individual, one arrest, one prosecution, you're done. Here, you might have multiple levels of intervention. You might have to do anywhere from one to a hundred different things to get that place sorted out. So there are a lot of resources out there. Some of them are here in the book. Um, Chris was going to talk about some, but I know we're talking, uh, we're short on time. But everything is in your handout, in your book, on where you can go find some of these uh, projects, some of these interventions, some of these things that have succeeded in, the year, uh, in uh, past cities to help you out. How do you arrest this problem? Well, don't think of it as an arrest. Once again, let's think of it as an intervention. So we've got the intervention. We've gone in. We've attacked the problem. We've tried to debate some of the issues. We've reduced some of the crime. Um, do we have a follow-up? Yes, we have a follow-up. We have a follow-up intervention to kind of tie up the loose ends on some of these things that we weren't able to attack with the original intervention when we went in and set our plan back. It's kind of like a follow-up maintenance. Now, maintenance and follow-up. Uh, this is the best thing that police departments in America do. We have the best maintenance and follow-up plans. We lock them down. We talk about them. We put them together, and then we never, if rarely, ever follow up on them. Yeah, we give it about 30 days. We'll put some resources in there. We'll follow up. We'll do what we can. And then eventually you'll go, uh, everybody's gone. In case of places, it's very important to make sure your intervention has a maintenance and a follow-up plan, and a maintenance and follow-up plan that you're going to stick to and continue to do into the future not just kind of brush stroke it like we tend to do in the past. I, I see that more often than I probably should. Man, I just can't get this thing straight. And there we go. We talked about our case. Now let's get down to where we ended up. This is a case of places summary checklist. As you can see, this is very similar to the case folder checklist that we have for homicides. Um, this, uh, when we talked yesterday for a short time, uh, Professor Lum brought up change in police departments is a really difficult thing for, uh, for us to go through. We're set in our ways, we're regimented, uh, we like things the way we like to do them, and, and change is very hard. Um, one of the first things that we talked about is, I said, important for police departments to make a philosophical change is the leadership in that police department has to be able to sell that change. If you can't sell the change, then you don't have change. So the leadership has to be able to sell it. And then you have to sell it in such a way that the officers on the street and your mid-level management can sell it and embrace that change. And then once you do that, one of the easiest things and what's great about this particular plan is it's easy to sell because all we did was mirror something we were already doing. And change is easy to sell if you say, hey, we're really not changing all that much. We already do it here. Just change the name of it. We're going to do the same thing. We're not going after a person. We're going after a place. We're not going after just one crime. We're going after them all. We're not going to just change one number on the stat sheet. We're going to hopefully change all of them. And once you can start to sell something on something they've already done, they've already embraced, I think change becomes much easier. And with that, I hope that I've gotten through there in my requisite amount of time and moved you on to the next phase. This is Officer Neal. Officer Neal. And uh, he's actually the one that's implementing this change here in the city of Richmond. Good luck with that. That thing is scary. <laughs> Again, I'm Officer Thomas Neal with the Richmond Police Department, and I'm going to real briefly go over uh, some of the challenges that I've found so far uh, working as a case agent for this investigation and also some of my initial findings. 
this was a map uh, when I first began the investigation. The department chose uh, the entire area that you see colored in as the area for investigation. Um, however, once we started, we quickly realized that this was a little bit too ambitious and that we needed to narrow it down a little bit. So I uh, went back to the drawing board and came up with the area that you see um, closed in by the red border as the new area to focus on. Um, if anyone's familiar with Broad Street, this is uh, in the area, or excuse me, if anyone's familiar with Richmond, this is the area of Broad Street, uh, near 1st, 2nd, 3rd Street, and so forth. However, once I began looking a little bit deeper, uh, I saw that um, even though we had this uh, smaller box to focus on for the investigation, that really a lot of the crime was not spread evenly throughout. Kind of like it's already been talked about, we've had hot spots or micro places. Um, once I started getting maps and data from our crime analysis unit, I saw that these clusters were pretty obvious. And uh, what you see in the red circle are some of those clusters. Um, generally, they're near intersections. Um, busy bus stops are also near some of our restaurants and bars. Um, also, uh, just being in the downtown area um, presents a lot of unique challenges for policing that I've noticed in, in, in my time there. Um, our population shrinks and swells uh, depending on the day of the week, the time of the day. If we have any events going on downtown, uh, vehicle traffic is very sporadic. It depends on uh, if it's rush hour, if it's before or after these events. Also on the weekends when the clubs and bars let out, obviously there's more vehicle traffic. Um, our residential population is really mostly uh, students at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, so naturally they kind of come and go with the school year. Some of the initial challenges that I've found, and also some of the needs as I've begun my investigation, is the biggest one is trying to sell old ideas, uh, old theories and methods that have been around for a long time and have been successfully used at uh, various departments around the country and the world, taking these old ideas and putting them together as a new package and trying to sell this to my fellow officers and supervisors. And it's still, it's not an easy task, but still working on and making a lot of progress. Another big challenge is really trying to see beyond the individual offender as the biggest problem, but also looking at the place where he or she operates and trying to recognize that as being part of the, uh, the equation. Um, some of the needs for uh, the investigation is definitely accurate, complete statistics from crime analysis. Um, also another important thing is um, trying to get away from the time constraints. Just like Captain Williams will tell you with a homicide investigation or any kind of investigation of a crime or person or group of people is you can't rush it. You have to let it progress naturally. And so if you try to put a, a real soon uh, deadline on it, then uh, you'll end up losing out on a lot of uh, potential. And then a couple of quick findings that I have found so far in my investigation, which again is still in the early stages. Um, some of our suspects, uh, police sus or play suspects, are uh, the intersection of 2nd Marshall Street um, near that intersection, which is uh, an intersection of two one-way streets, which makes policing a little bit more difficult. Um, there's a restaurant nearby that generates a lot of calls for service. A lot of disorderly calls, quality of life cr uh, crimes come from that restaurant. Um, there's also a lot of nearby alleys, cut-throughs that allow for great vehicle traffic and uh, foot traffic to the surrounding streets. And then another uh, suspect place is the intersection of Fushi and Broad Street. Uh, there's a nightclub at that intersection that caters to juvenile parties frequently. Um, and there's also an alley that runs behind it with several parking lots that have uh, cut throughs, again, to the surrounding streets and through the alley. Um, as has already been touched on, victims can obviously include places and people. And uh, some of our places that are victims are any free wall that can be tagged. Graffiti is a big problem, and as soon as it gets cleaned off, it seems that it pops up again. Um, and unfortunately, uh, some of our visitors that come down to the area to enjoy a lot of our great restaurants and venues find themselves victimized uh, when their cars are broken into or they may be a, a victim of a robbery. Um, and uh, lastly, Captain Williams already talked about some of the guardians, the formal and informal, but I also wanted to touch on the uh, what I call the non-guardians. And that's people that, people or establishments that you would generally expect to be a part of the solution to help ameliorate the crime problem, but really may be a part of the problem themselves. And that in our area, that is usually our places that serve alcohol. Um, some of our 
restaurants and, and whatnot, and also their owners and, uh, and managers. And so one of the tricky parts is trying to figure out how to include them as part of the eventual uh, intervention. Um, again, my investigation is still in the early stages. Um, I've got a little bit ways to go, but I'm confident that I'm on the right track. Um, I think that once I uh, get a little bit further, I'll be able to come up with a coordinated uh, intervention plan with everybody else in the department that's helping me out. And uh, I'm confident that once we get started that we can have a, a good positive effect on our crime rates in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I should also mention that uh, Officer Neal is uh, one of our graduates from Georgia Mason, so we're uh, very glad to have him back. Uh, next, we're going to bring up uh, Sergeant Jeff Eggy, who's the Director of Crime Analysis for the Minneapolis Police Department. And he's going to be talking about a case of places uh, effort in uh, Minneapolis. He was with us at last year's symposium. We're very glad to have him back again this year. We think he's one of the nation's premier crime analysts, and uh, we'll tell you about some work that he's beginning to do now on a case of places uh, demonstration in, in Minneapolis. Thank you. Um, over the years that I've been collaborating with Cynthia and Chris, we've been trying to carry the torch of uh, uh, Larry Sherman and David Weisberg on some of these things, and Minneapolis has this history of going back to the early 80s or the mid 80s uh, on some of these things, and here's some of the more innovations that we've been trying to do with um, uh, predictive analytics, mainly because uh, as, as we find with some of the information that we've heard today is, you know, uh, places are six times more predictable than people. When you really uh, think about this, this actual number of 5% of the places equaling 50% of the crime problem, or what Anthony Braga uh, recently uh, spoke about Boston with gun crime, that it's 75% uh, it's equals 74% of the problem with gun crime. That, that, that's just astonishing, it's very, very predictive. Um, when the uh, administration came to me and said, do you, you want to uh, implement some of these ideas that you have in terms of gun crime? Uh, we, we, have a, we had a series of young uh, kids get shot over the last summer and, um, and at the time, uh, you know, Chris, a couple of years ago, Chris, uh, Dr. Coper and I were at a meeting at the IACP in which we were uh, talking about ideas and, and, and churning ideas about how to you know, be aggressive on gun crime. And one of, at the time, I was working on a cop's guidebook, uh, how to integrate crime analysis into patrol. And, uh, and uh, the first thing I thought of was, well, crime analysis, of course. And so it, it sort of segues into this whole idea about case of places. It's, it's, the, it's the sort of the common sense segue into this type of thing. So we, we focused, 50% of our gun crime problems are on the north side, the fourth precinct of Minneapolis. And this is sort of a quick and dirty uh, uh, assessment of what that crime problem is there. It, I call this sort of the, the chaos sort of uh, um, account. And uh, because, because you, as you can see, 60,000 or 60,000 calls for service in a particular year. Um, but, but most troubling is there's a bit of an, out, uh, you know, an outnumbering type of thing, maybe about approximately 130 officers, but a uh, 1,000 gang members that actually, uh, or 1,000 people are associated with gangs that are in that, in that general vicinity. A little bit of a troubling type of thing. And then you throw into, in, in this illustration, those stars are, are basically shooting incidents from that same period. So, um, so uh, when we started to look at these hot spots of gun crime in Minneapolis, we found, again, that they were very, very concentrated. Uh, and and uh, the, our, our reaction to these areas has been that traditional intuitive reaction uh, tactics. And our goal, of course, was to leverage those areas. But as you can see, what I've tried to do here is I've tried to take these, uh, these areas and really sort of uh, mirror our, our analytic language to more like what Braga was actually doing with, with street segments. Or, or uh, Larry and David were trying to do way back when in Minneapolis talking about those smaller places than some of these larger geographic areas that we had identified. So what you can see here is I've taken these, these 10 years, two, uh, 
year 2000 to 2010 versus the most recent five years and then taking the most recent years uh, in here to try to sort of layer them on top of each other. What you see here is this is, this is uh, uh, the, the second tier of uh, the decade. Uh, you can see here is this, this is five year and 10 year and, and you'll start to see these patterns. But that's, the, that's generally what the fourth precinct looks like in that area. Um, last year, we talked about this, the success that we had in PV Park in which uh, we really dissected sort of all of those things, trying to understand what we were going, what, what was really at play here in this area. And we found by taking these areas like calls for service and, and even incidents that we found that it was an open air drug market, basically, we were able to show that. It also affected the tactics. We put the best person we had uh, uh, in narcotics enforcement in that area. We had a demonstrable effect and it ultimately took the whole the whole city's crime rates and started to move it in the in the more positive direction. It changed the trajectory of that of this um, of this area by about 20 percent. When we talk about case of places, we're we're really talking about peeling back the onion from an analytic standpoint. So we take a a city view here, try to work it into like a micro area right like this, which which is a troubling area here on the north side of Minneapolis where. Um, the night that we put this an an analysis out, we had a murder that night of a cab driver that actually drove into this area. Very, um, very troubling type of thing. Um, one of the things that uh, I was at a, uh, a symposium at the Police Executive Research Forum in March on gun crime. We, we had an, a, a very long, extensive conversation about that, but this was, the, this, was that con uh, this, this was that sort of conclusion is we're not going to arrest our way out of this problem. Um, so what, this is sort of a slide that I had from most of these presentations and, and conversations that we've been having about prioritizing gun crime. The key was that, that dialogue, it's, it's, we are trying to prioritize that. We're putting it in there and, and really trying to synthesize some of this information. One of the earliest attempts at doing this, this is, this, this is a, an area that we were calling our hotspot for a long time. Chris would come back and say, well, you know, a little bit big in terms of the, defini the, the classical definition of, hot, of hotspots. Um, and he was correct, but that's, this is what the data was suggesting. We wanted to be, we wanted to deploy to the right places, we wanted the cops to be busy, we wanted them to be uh, integrating, but then when you started to sort of pick away at these areas with either what, whatever you wanted to look at it as calls for service, you started to see these pockets. This is actually, these are actually gun crime hotspots from last year using 1,000 by 1,000 grids. And, and then when we start picking it apart, we start to see these patterns in these, in these calls for service areas. Uh, again, it's sort of that peeling back of the onion. But when you start to see the, when you start looking at it a little bit more microscopically, you start to see these patterns here on Dowling and Fremont. You start to see this, some of these other patterns here. So I'll sort of describe that. This is, and this is that sort of a little bit more microscopic look here, um, where you can see these patterns of activity going back decades. You can see the most recent activities. Here's this gun crime hotspot right here. Um, and, and so from, the, from really looking at this case of places idea, we started to basically narrow this down and say, we think this is the hot spot. We think that, uh, that this corridor is, is it. Here's, here's a convenience store here, and I'll show you another illustration of that. Um, what we measure, we do well. Um, it, it, we integrated this into our CompStat at the beginning of the year, and we created these type of measurements to sort of understand um, understand more about the, the crime. We included these, these gun crime measures. Uh, this is the, if you can see what I'm pointing at here, this is this UCR definition. Uh, oftentimes the UCR wasn't getting us to some of, this, some of these issues. As you can see though, using that de definition, we have a 20, uh, two, uh, 233% increase in assault with firearms. It's a pure gun crime hotspot, even more than it is, for instance, with our Bell Weather crime, which is robbery. Um, I'll, and I'll just take you quickly through this one. Um, this is assaults for uh, the last 10 years in this general area. Um, and you can see we, we've also included the fifth degree assaults right here. What you're seeing is a lot of, you're seeing a lot of assaults, right? Uh, and, and you're seeing a lot of simple assaults. This is actually a city park. And why, uh, this, this was not a surprise to me that you see this here because there is guardianship in this area. There is definitely that. And they, maybe they feel more comfortable going to the, the, the park center and actually reporting their victimization at that location. But what you see here is there's that pocket, there's that pocket of crime, there's that pocket of crime. But most really troubling 
is this domestic assault number. Most of these assaults in this general area are domestic assaults. And that's just using, using these sort of part one crime categories that we had. But there is where you can see that concentration over 10 years just with assaults with a dangerous weapon. This was what we were using to sort of narrow us down into this idea and try to peel the onion back uh, before we start this, this case of places initiative. So there's that general geographic area that we're talking about. Number one calls for service in this area uh, over this period of time. And I was sort of limited by this, this, uh, uh, this data for calls for service because we had updated our, uh, our database on that and, and went with a new vendor. But uh, domestic assault calls were definitely number one. Dis uh, disturbances, shots fired calls, unknown trouble fighting. Um, in this domestic assault, there, there's, this is where the, the nut has to be cracked. These domestic assaults are, are ex you know, extremely troubling, but it's, it's sort of suggesting when you start to see that array of where they are in, within the hotspot, it's definitely in those, those apartment buildings and those houses that are uh, in that general vicinity, because we're only talking about roughly you know, two by two here, and that is the number of domestics in that particular area, as well as disturbances. The, and, and like, a, you know, probably what, 60% of those are, are really, you know, again, uh, a clear uh, gone on arrival. This area is distinguished by two things. This, these are the suspects. Um, one is a convenience store, the one at the top, uh, uh, is distinguished by a 2004 uh, murder that happened with one of their um, uh, employees uh, in a robbery attempt. The other one is the, is the, uh, the one at the, the farther south, which is, um, uh, you know, and I'll show you some of the illustrations of that. Uh, and this is uh, the day I w went out there uh, last week, and uh, there, were the, uh, there were these, uh, uh, this street preacher was out doing a uh, protest or against gun violence in that area when I went out there. Um, and what he had told me, he said, in this area here, there were a dozen you know, ruffians that were sort of loitering in this area. He said across the street in front of an apartment complex, the same thing, and at the bus stop, the same exact thing. He said they cleared out. Um, and uh, so this is that sort of that illustration, as I said, here's that market, here's that, that uh, uh, um, convenience store. What we found when we started to take a look at these as we started to really break away into these calls for service top locations, we found this cluster of apartments here. They're owned by the same person. That person does not live in the city, they live in a suburb. Same thing here, this is a house. Same thing, uh, same thing here. This apartment complex here is actually, uh, that this takes a little bit more work because that is the address of an apartment complex, but it may be also be shorthand for officers that are working this, this particular intersection and documenting the incidents on there. Also distinguished by this uh, transit bus that comes right back and forth. Very busy intersection, a lot of uh, homes up and down here, a few apartment complexes, like, like I said, here, and right over here. Um, and again, there's the, these are the top locations. So oftentimes, I think it, when you look at you know, these, these crime data, you'll start to see these uh, intersections. So a lot of it's being written towards those intersections. If you have any questions, just feel free to fire in the way. Um, you don't see my handouts in this book for obvious reasons. Some of this, I, you know, I don't generally come to academic institutions and do presentations. This is for actual. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, analysis and, and uh, deploying resources on this. When I said this thing about the, this thousand uh, associated gang members in this area, it was, uh, th there was actually, it was, it was stunning and everybody said, well, it's not gonna be, of, it's not gonna be of much value when you have a thousand, what's it's gonna look like over a course of a, a precinct. What this sort of micro place analysis offers you is this ability to really zoom in on this area. The hot spot that we identified was identified before we realized this huge concentration of people associated with gang members. Where are they going? What, what are those, uh, um, uh, what is bringing those people to this area? When you look at the checklist that uh, Richmond was showing, what is bringing those people into the area? So we had to broaden that sort of, that sort of definition of what was associated with those, with those individuals. That's what you're seeing here. Before this gets put on the internet, it'll have to be a little bit sanitized in here, but it gives you a general vicinity or ge a general um, idea of what we were dealing with in this particular area and what those routines are in that, in that area. What, this is sort of an example of what we uh, put out to patrol on this, giving uh, peak times of day for these crimes. What are the best times for our officers to actually go to these areas and be focused and proactive? Um, 
and, and what are those top addresses in which to do that. Um, my assistant chief and future chief is, is here uh, today and, um, and I wanted her to, you know, she has seen this before, but uh, she's here to sort of, um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, judge whether or not this is where, this is the direction we want to go. We have some proposals in the works uh, moving forward to uh, um, trying to delve more into this. I, I don't have a lot on, on victimology here or some of the, the, the victim things on here, but that, this is sort of our, our first foray into, um, into this uh, uh, endeavor, trying to really peel back what really is going on in some of these micro places. I picked one to sort of focus on, and as I showed you earlier, we got five or six of them. Um, and to do this properly, it probably needs that one, that one uh, detective on each one of these locations to really delve into that thing, be that person in, in, that the community can see is interested in those problems. Uh, when, I, when I've been in this area, I've asked, I've asked people, uh, the passers-by or, the, or the, some of the leaders in those areas, what is really at play here? And they say, poverty is what's at play here. Um, when you start to watch the routines of these people, they are definitely gravitating to these, these stores. Um, my experience as an officer in this area is a lot of these people uh, uh, you don't have a lot of food in their houses. Um, this, these stores uh, provide these opportunities to go. Get, uh, while I was standing there, it was uh, uh, going to get ice cream. And as these guys were chased away, these kids started coming out and walking down the street and coming to get ice cream and enjoying their ice cream right out there on a hot day. We've had, you know, really, I think, one of the, the second or the first warmest uh, uh, summer in Minnesota this, this summer. And, uh, so they were out there, and, and, and I had asked, I said, is this, is this sort of normal? I said, we've chased away the drug dealers, and we chased away all these other people. And as soon as that, those street preachers left the area, we started to see this gravitation back in there. The, the, the um, bus stops started to get more, uh, uh, they started to come out of the woodwork and stand in front of the bus stops. They started uh, conglomerating in front of the apartment building across the street from, from this particular market and in front of the market. Um, so it's uh, this is sort of a. Anybody have any questions on what I showed you so far? Anyone? I'm on Richmond. Oh, I got one. Yes, sir. What are you doing about this, this niche problem and encouraging citizens to discreetly talk to police officers to get information to know who the bad guys are, who may be around, who's packing the gun. Yeah, when I was when I was out there, that was two days after a murder had happened, roughly with, within a block of that area. Um, there was a great deal of fear, and the, you're talking about the no snitch sort of uh, uh, cultural. Yeah, I, and I asked a question somewhat along that line to some of the people that I interacted when I was out there, and and uh, and they want to see somebody out there that's interested in that's out there walking in a lot of ways, um, that's interested in listening to them or being a part of their community, um, and and I think that that's that's sort of the step at how to break down some of those barriers because it is a, a pervasive barrier and trying to get information and, and trying to solve crimes and, and things like that. Um, what we're, we're primarily, and, and we have that as an objective, what we're really trying to do is trying to decrease crime in these, in these areas. So it really means being out there and in, you know, improving the public safety as well as improving that trust of the community in that area. Being there, being present, being listening, and being uh, engaging those people is, is sort of that way to start breaking that down. And we'll see, hopefully going forward, if, if that is a successful thing. I'm confident that that is a good start in that direction. Uh, can I suggest, um, Jeff, that we take kind of a working break? So if anybody wants to ask questions, we'll take questions now. Uh, but if everyone can just maybe take 10 minutes. We, we've created a bit of a buffer zone within our lunch period. So if everyone wants to take 10 minutes for a break, I know we've, we've uh, gone over time a little bit. Please do. And um, if you'd like to ask questions while that's happening, we're happy to take questions. Thanks, Jeff.